coming. Chronic inflammation, very exciting topic. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely exciting. <laughs> For people who have nothing else to do in there, no. So, um, how many of you take aspirin, baby aspirin? Give me kind of an idea. A uh, few of you. Okay. Not all too many. So, Let's start the story with actually talking about aspirin, which you might not believe it, is more than 110 years old. It was 1897 that a Swiss chemist of name Mr. Hoffman, which had nothing to do with the Albert Hoffman, who about 50 years later synthesized LSD, and, not a, few, and a few years later psilocybin, um, and just died a few years ago with, in the age of 102. Another Mr. Hoffman, one of the Swiss Hoffmans. And he synthesized aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. And as you all know, aspirin was used for inflammation, joint inflammation, arthritis, achiness, pain. Now, then a few years ago, studies came out that showed that aspirin, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory NSAID, yeah, as we call that medically, that aspirin had a preventative effect on heart disease. Now, what exactly has a pain medication, thank you, Luna, what has a pain medication to do with prevention of heart disease. Then some years later, it came out that aspirin had actually had a preventative effect on various cancers, amongst others, colon cancer. Yeah, 20 to 30 percent reduction of colon cancer. People take baby aspirin regularly, or for the matter, any aspirin regularly for a few years. What the heck has colon cancer to do with an anti-inflammatory? Okay, which I still remember at that time, in my mind, was somewhere in the 90s, I believe, right? 80s, did not make a lot of sense. I still remember that moment where I was kind of baffled about it. Here's this category, arthritis, you know, and here's colon cancer, and how do they exactly fit together? And then, not so many years ago, studies came out that show people take a baby aspirin actually have a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. Another of these surprises, okay? So, now, inflammation we know since a long time, and uh, actually since a very, very long time, because it's an experience you won't forget. So for example, a old grandmother cuts her toenails, and she doesn't see all too well, as happens, and cuts into her flesh on the side of her toenail, Two days later, she wakes up and she has all the wonderful signs, which the, the Greek, actually, uh, physician Galen, who lived in Rome at that time, was hip to live in Rome at that time. It was exactly 2,000 years ago, the place to be, named Rubor, Dolor, Calor, and Tumor. Okay, the old signs of inflammation. Rubor means redness, the toe is red. Kalo means it's hot. Um, Rubber color tumor means it's swollen. And what else was? And pain. Okay, dolor. Typical signs of inflammation. So wherever you have rubber color dolor and uh, what was the other one? <laughs> you have inflammation. Okay, tonsils get red. They get swollen. They're painful, and here you have it. Okay, toenail, same thing, anywhere. Joint is that degenerative joint disease or inflammatory joint disease. Well, is it warm? Is it hot? Well, painful, both of them are potentially. Is it swollen? Well, it might be inflammatory joint disease, something like rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease. Okay, or a bug got into it in an in injury and it flames it. So inflammation we know in medicine since ages, acute inflammation. And we know exactly what then happens in the body who kind of once some bug gets in, let's say staph, 
uh, Steph Aureus in that example with the toenail gets in or strep in your throat or sinuses or wherever, bladder, what have you. Some kind of bacterium gets into the system. And then the immune system, the called innate immune system, says, oh, this thing doesn't quite look like me. Okay? And starts harboring a response. And then a whole cascade of events go off, uh, increased blood circulation, increased lymph flow, and then all kinds of inflammatory cells, white blood cells, travel to that area to then combat the box. And then even more sophisticated, since some years we know that a ton of messenger um, molecules, peptides mostly, little chains of amino acids, uh, so-called so cytokines, turn on the immune system, and then the immune system is turned on, and then will, after about five to six to seven days, harbor a specific defense. Yeah? So it starts out with an unspecific defense, where it just the body puts up a wall and makes it difficult, and then there's a very specific defense where specifically that bug will be killed by the immune system, yeah, one by one. It's not nice. So uh, if you think about it, at the base of life is survival, yeah, and it's either me or the other, which goes not so well with the Christian doctrine. The immune system will turn the other cheek. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. So that's made on a higher level. But life is strange, you know, if you think about it, you know, it's actually brutal. It's me or the other. It's the law of the jungle somewhere in the immune system. And people try to come up with nice metaphors, you know, for people who have cancer, for example, and did visualization, Simonton's technique. How do you now visualize your immune system taking over the cancer cells? And uh, many people hate to use bellows, war metaphors, you know? So they try to hug, they have the immune system hug the cancer cells to death. So it doesn't quite work so well, all right? So it's, it's uh, combat in there. And um, then the specific immune system kicks in, and then it's normally over. Okay, so that means after a week to 10 days, maximum 14 days, the immune system amasses uh, so many um, antibodies and immune cells that specifically then kill the bacterium, it's over, and then it either heals out, uh, toenail goes away, tonsillitis goes away, or it builds a scar, let's say there's a deep injury, someone has an accident, you know, and uh, ends up with a scar, or an abscess, tons of pus, and so on, which then eventually heals up. Now, sometimes, rarely, we do know that then this acute inflammation, yeah, which happens multiple times in all of our lives, um, turns into a chronic inflammation. For example, if you have a leg ulcer and, or an injury in your leg and the person is overweight and does have a slow lymph flow back and the terrain around that wound now is such that it can't heal very well, yeah, because it's too much wetness and so on in the area, um, then this ulcer doesn't heal and it goes on and on and on and on and uh, you try to take antibiotics and elevate the foot and try to lose weight and once they lose weight then often it gets better, okay? So chronic inflammation. We knew that some people do have chronic inflammation and that was the old scenario, happens rarely and uh, normally acute inflammation so uh, heal out but Let's say you have a prostatitis, a man has a prostatitis, acute inflammation of the prostate, has to pee multiple times, has dull pain, has fever, dull pain in the pelvic floor, has fever. And then hopefully with the help of some antibiotics, it will be over. But sometimes it's not. And this is a rare cases where this man then continue to have night sweats and uh, dull pain and have problems peeing and the whole malaise. So, rare happening somewhat, specifically since we have antibiotics. Yeah? In the old days, out in the jungle, when there was nutritional deficiencies at times, they didn't have food because the season were bad, was bad or there was winter, there was extreme dire 
um, circumstances, um, hygiene didn't exist, and people got older and so on, and that's then eventually how they died. You know, in the old days, people died through infections. Yeah? That's the old rule, not the case anymore with us. So now, a whole new paradigm developed that actually chronic inflammation is something we have, and many of us have, and it's unknown to us because it doesn't cause these obvious symptoms, but we have it anyway, and potentially it is now following the logic of aspirin at the base of heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, potentially many chronic degenerative diseases. Surprise, surprise. And medicine then <coughs> came up with the idea, well, you just have to take an aspirin and everything will be fine. Well, not quite, because as exciting as this data about aspirin are, on the other side, every drug has side effects, and we know that thousands of people every year die from side effects of non-steroidals. Actually, 16,000 people every year in America. 16,000 people a year. Yeah, nobody talks about these things. Now, in all honesty, these are not necessarily people who take a baby aspirin preventatively for heart disease or for whatever. These are often people with uh, chronic...